This morning, the title of my message is, God, Please Give Me Influence. The title of my message today is actually a prayer that was prayed hundreds of years ago by a person that's not very well known in Scripture. In fact, he's only mentioned twice in the Bible, one that we're going to read in one other place. In 1 Chronicles chapter 4, in verse number 10, this prayer was prayed. In fact, the title of my message is the prayer that this individual prayed. He prayed this, God, please enlarge my coast. Now, in our modern-day vernacular, we would say, God, please give me influence for good and for God. God, help me to be an influencer of people in the world in which I live. That was the prayer that this gentleman prayed years ago. I hope that that would be your prayer today. In fact, we're going to pray that prayer. If you would like to pray that prayer, God, please enlarge my coast. God, please give me influence in my world. I'm going to give you an opportunity right now to pray that prayer. You don't need to bow your head. You don't need to close your eyes. You can look up at the screen, and we're going to all pray this prayer together. But understand this. You're not praying to the pastor. You're not praying to other people. This is a prayer that you're voicing to God Almighty. And I hope that as you pray these words, as you say these words, that these words will penetrate your heart and your mind. They will find a place in you. And it will not only be words that you say or a a prayer that you pray on this Sunday morning, but it will be something that will motivate you and encourage you and give you a belief that as you leave here, God is going to do something special in your life. He's going to increase your influence. So if you want God to do that for you, I want you to pray this prayer. Pray it with me out loud. Are you ready? God, please give me influence for you in my world. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, we don't need to pray it again. God heard it the first time. God heard what you said. And I'm believing and I hope that you're believing that from this point forward, God is going to do something special in your life. I want you to know that that was not a selfish prayer. You think, should I be praying for God to give me influence? No, you got to understand. This is not a selfish prayer because you're not really praying for yourself. You're really praying that God would work through you to enlarge the influence that you have for him. You see, I believe that God wants you to be used by him to make his name known, to make who he is known to the world. So this is not a selfish prayer. This is a selfless prayer. You're giving up yourself to God and asking him to use you so that his name will be known in a better and bigger way through your life. You can have influence. Some of you heard, I'm sure this morning on social media, maybe you heard it on the news that one of the greatest ba- well, one of the greatest football coaches, college football coaches of all time passed away, Bobby Bowden. Bobby Bowden passed away. I love Bobby Bowden. Bobby Bowden was my second favorite football coach of all time. He was influenced by my favorite football coach of all time, Bear Bryant. Bear Bryant mentored Bobby Bowden. Bobby Bowden became a great football coach, won national championships, had great football influence. But Bobby Bowden had more than just football influence. Bobby Bowden was an influencer of people. He influenced people for good and for God. We had Bobby Bowden come here and speak at our church several years back. 
And Bobby spoke for our Spirit of Christmas service, and he shared his testimony. He told his story of how he had received Jesus as his Savior. You know, Bobby Bowden led people to Christ all the time. You know, he led Mark Rick to Christ. Mark Rick was the head football coach at University of Georgia. He led Mark Rick to Jesus. And there are plenty of other men and folks, that he, women, that he led to Jesus. He had an influence. When he was here, he spoke right here on this stage. And, uh, and he left his notes on the pulpit. When he left, he forgot his notes. Well, his notes were about on a piece of paper about that big, it was three points. <laughs> I mean, it wasn't a whole lot of notes there. It was three points, boom, boom, boom. And I thought, man, I got to, you know, what do I do with these notes, you know? And so I said, well, I'll just call and find out what, what he wants me to do with them. I mean, you know, what like a, a big, long something that he wrote out. It took two hours to write it out. He probably wrote it out on the way when he was driving over here, to be honest with you. And I said, well, what am I going to do with this? So I called the number that I had for Bobby Bowden. His wife answered the phone. And I said, this is Gordon Godfrey. I'm getting nervous, you know. I'm thinking, you know, this is Gordon Godfrey, Pastor Oh, yeah, Brother Gordon. Hey, Bobby, it's Brother Gordon on the phone. This was his house that I called. I thought I'd get his agent, you know, or, or some person that screened his phone calls. It was Bobby Bowden's house, and his wife answered the telephone, and she said, Hey, Bobby, it's Brother Gordon on the phone. He said, I'm coming, honey, and he came to the phone. And I thought, Oh, my Lord. And he got on the phone. I said, uh, Mr. Bowden, Brother Bobby, uh, Coach Bowden, uh, I, I found your notes on my pulpit. He goes, Yeah. I said, You want me to? Mail them back to you, or what do you want me to do with them? You want me to keep them? He said, let me tell you something. Here's what you do. He said, send them back to me, and I'm going to write you a special note on them, and I'm going to send them back to you. I said, wow. I thought, okay, you know, I'll probably never hear from that again, you know. And so I had my secretary, you know, send them to him, and they went to him, and about two weeks later, I got an envelope back from Bobby Bowden and I opened it up and it was his notes. He had autographed his notes and wrote a little note on there to me and mailed them back to me. I got them sitting in my office up on my shelf. A man of influence. He loves people. He cares about people. Making a difference in the world. I believe Bobby Bowden would have prayed a prayer just like you prayed this morning. God, expand my coast. God, expand my influence. Well, who was it that prayed this prayer in the Bible? Well, write this name down. Jabez, you've heard of the name now, haven't you? You remember the little book that was out several years back called The Prayer of Jabez. Jabez came from a great family. You realize that his great, 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 great grandfather was a fellow by the name of Abraham. You ever heard that name? Yeah. His great, great grandfather was a fellow by the name of David. So he had a godly heritage. I mean, he had people in his, in his family heritage that were very well known, that were big time people. But Jabez was a nobody. Nobody knew the name Jabez. In fact, write this down. When he was born, his name, his, his, his mother named him. His name means pain. <laughs> she said, boy, you're a pain in the, you know what? <laughs> she said, he's a pain. Well, I don't think she was talking about childbirth because everybody that's born calls his mama to have some pain when you're born. I don't think that's what she was talking about. I think that God gave her this name for him because Jabez was going to be a pain. <laughs> I think Jabez is one of those kind of kids that's mischievous. He's one of those kind of kids that's always getting in trouble. He's one of those kind of kids, you know, that's just always into things. You know, everybody's got one of those in, in their family. You know, maybe you were one of those kind of kids. Maybe as you were growing up, people didn't think you were going to be a success. They thought you were going to be in jail. <laughs> I think that's what they thought about Jabez. And every time they saw Jabez, they thought, there's the guy that's the pain, man. He's trouble. But you know, God takes 
nobodies, and God specializes in making them into somebodies. God takes the inferior and makes them into superior tools for him. God took a little kid that was a nobody and changed his life this past Wednesday night. At the end of our starting point class, I teach starting point. We invite new people to come to starting point, and, and I get to meet them. And this, this um, husband and wife came, and at the end of the class, this gentleman came up to me. He said, Pastor, he said, man, what you said tonight really spoke to my heart. It really helped me. He said, i got to tell you a little bit about myself. I said, yes, sir. What? He said, I was one of those kind of kids that didn't have a chance. I had nobody in my family that cared about me. He said, I just turned into a street kid, got in lots of trouble, went to jail. He said, but God used that to get a hold of my life, and God changed my life. He said, now I'm living for God. I used to be one of those kind of people, but I'm not anymore. It's exactly what I'm talking about. God can take somebody and change their life. Now, here's what I believe. I believe that's exactly what happened to Jabez. I believe Jabez would have been somebody that might have ended up in jail had God not got a hold of his life. In fact, notice what the Bible says in verse number 9. The Bible says, and Jabez was more honorable than all of his brothers. Jabez was more honorable than all of his brothers. Wait a second. I thought he was a troublemaker. I thought he was a kid that lived in, you know, kind of was, would, could have ended up in jail. Yeah, but somewhere along the line, God got a hold of his heart and God changed his life. Because that word honorable, you know what it means? It means integrity. The Bible says here that Jabez had more integrity than all of his brothers. So at some point, God got a hold of him, and God changed him from being a nobody that was down, going down the wrong road, changed him, and turned him into somebody that was a person of integrity. You know what that word integrity means? The word integrity means you do the right thing when nobody's looking. You don't do the right thing because somebody's watching you. You do the right thing because it's right. Because you want God to bless your life. You want to be right with God. And so you've decided that you're going to do the right thing when nobody's looking, when nobody knows you're going to do the right thing. You will become a person of integrity when you do the right thing when no one knows. The Bible says here, that Jabez became a person of integrity. He was not someone that was looking for shortcuts to success. You see, there are a lot of people that think that they can take shortcuts and go around doing right and cheat a little bit on doing right and take a shortcut and that it won't affect their life. Let me tell you, if you live a life of taking the road of least resistance, you're not going to be a person of integrity. A person of integrity goes through the hard times, through the difficult times. They don't try to run from those things. They ask God to help them get through those things and do the right thing when they're going through those things. A person that stands up and faces the difficult times in life head on and asks God to get through those things, those people not taking shortcuts, they become people of integrity. People that take shortcuts don't become people of integrity. So don't think that you can take shortcuts and it won't affect your life. It will affect your life. If you're always looking for a way around right, if you're always looking for an easier way, listen, there is no easy way to being an honorable person. Jabez learned that God was going to make him a person of integrity if he would follow God and do the right thing. It's so cool around here now is we've been doing ministry here for 30 years. And I look on this stage 
And I see people on this stage that were 10, 11, 12 years old when I came here. And now they're up here grown people with teenagers. And I'm a geezer. I'm old. I've been doing this a long time now. I've been here 30 years. But it's awesome to do the right thing for a long time and begin to see the result of your ministry, see the result of your doing the right thing for a long time. You begin to see it in people's lives. And people that were kids are now grown up and they're serving in this ministry and they're leaders in this ministry and they're leaders out there in our city. They're leaders in business. They're leaders in the classroom. They're leaders on the athletic field out there in the community. They're leaders in the banking industry. They're just leaders out there. But they started here years ago and God is blessed now and grown up a whole segment of this community <laughs> Over time, that's what happens when you decide that you're going to be a person of integrity for, a long, for the long haul. You know, shooting stars look good for a quick, short time. <laughs> you ever been out in your backyard and you see a, sh a shooting star and you go, you want to go in and get your brother, get your sister, get your wife. You got to come see this shooting star. When you, by the time you get back out there, it's gone. Right? Why? Because it's, it, it burns up. It's gone. Shooting star. Listen, God doesn't want you to be a shooting star. God wants you to be a person that goes on and on and on and lives a life of integrity year after year after year. Not a flash in the pan, uh, a shooting star that blows up and burns up in a short period of time. Jabez was a person of integrity. Now, let's look at the prayer that he prayed. Look at verse number 10. Look what he prayed. He said, he called on the God of Israel and he said, Oh, that thou wouldest bless me indeed and enlarge my coast, that your hand would be on me, that thou wouldest keep me from evil, that it may not grieve me. And that God, and God granted him that which he requested. He prayed. First of all, I want to say, pray to God. You know, there's some people when they pray, they don't pray to God. Have you ever heard anybody pray and say, and you knew they was praying for the people listening? You ever heard somebody get up and they pray the King's English? <laughs> I mean, they're they from South Alabama. When they pray, they start praying like King James prayed. You ever heard that? Oh, God of the universe, thou that lovest me, God that takest care of me, blesseth me, you know, on and on and on. That's, well, who are you praying to? You praying to the people that are listening or are you praying to God? I'd a whole lot rather have a guy get up here and go, hey, me, God, it's me again. Yeah, God, you know I, I messed up last week. You saw it. I'm sorry. Thank you for giving me another chance. It's me. I just am here to ask you to help me today, God, because I want to do the right thing. God, you know, yeah, it's me. You know, I believe Jabez was the kind of guy that would talk to God like he was talking to his daddy or talking to his brother or talking to his friend. And when you pray, you don't have to pray like anybody else is listening. Just pray. You say, Pastor, I don't know all the words. Just talk to God like you're talking to your friend, like you're talking to your daddy or your mama. God, it's me. Make me a person of integrity. God, make me a person of influence. He prayed to God. Look at his prayer. He said, God, number one, he said, God, bless me. Write it down. That's a good thing. Don't you want God to bless you? Ask God to bless you. Then he said, God, expand my influence. Expand my coast. That's awesome. Pray that prayer. God, make my life with a ripple effect. From my life goes that ripple effect of influencing other people. God, expand my influence. And then he said, God, would you guide me? That's a good thing to pray. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your path. When you pray, pray for God to 
guide you through life. You need help. I do too. We need to know what road to travel. We need to know what we should and shouldn't do. God, help me and guide me. And then he prayed, God, keep me from evil. That's an interesting prayer, isn't it? Let me tell you what he, means by, what he meant by that. You know, we need to pray, God, don't let me get off the, wrong, off the right track and on the wrong track. Keep me from bad stuff. But you know what? There's more to his prayer than that. I believe Jabez was saying this. Listen to me. He was saying, God, don't let me forget when I get to where I'm going. Don't let me forget where I came from. God, when you expand my coast, God, when you enlarge my influence and people know my name, and God, I got stuff. Lord, I've been blessed with money. God, I have a great job. I have a beautiful home. God, I got all this stuff. Lord, would you please not let me forget who gave it to me? God, don't let me forget how I got to where I am. I have people all the time come to my office. Over the years, it's happened. Pastor, things are just really bad. Please pray, God, give me a job. I need a job. I don't have a job. God, I don't know. Uh, Pastor, I don't know how I'm going to make it to the next meal. You know, I can't pay my bills. Would you help me? Yeah, we'll help you. And we help. And we give dollars or whatever. And we give advice. And then I pray for them and ask them to find a job. And so many times I've seen it happen. They find a good, a good job. They start making good money. And now what happens? See ya. <laughs> they gone. <laughs> you can't find them. The FBI can't find them. CIA can't find them. They gone. What happened to them? Well, God blessed them. So now they got a little bit of money. Now they got little, little you know, stuff that they can use. And so now instead of taking what God has blessed them with and remembering where they came from and using it for him, now they abandon the God that put them where they are. Uh-oh. I don't get no amen. I ain't get no amens in here this morning. Come on, y'all. That's good preaching, preacher. Keep on preaching it. That's right, because some of y'all, some of y'all remember when you was a nobody. When you didn't have a job. You didn't have a way to make it. You were looking for some way to make it to the next meal. And God blessed you and God gave to you. And now you're in good shape and you got stuff and you got a nice home and a nice car. Have you forgotten where you were? Have you forgotten where you came from? Are you giving back to God like he gave to you? Are you using what God has given you for influence for him? Or are you becoming a person that kind of just keeps it to yourself? Come on, y'all. God, make me a person of influence for you. and Use it for good and don't let evil overcome you. Do the right thing over the long haul. Your influence for peop on people will be better if you do it for the long haul. Keep on doing it. So the prayer that he prayed. Now I want you to look at number three. Write it down. Write down the plan within the prayer. His plan was this. God, I'm going to pray for you to bless me, but I'm going to plan so that I have a route to travel. God, you guide me down this route. I believe every person should pray to God, but they should have a plan. So you need to play, plan and you need to pray. Plan and pray with a purpose. God, give me a plan that I can have greater influence for you. Then God, give me the plan and the power and the commitment to follow through for you so that my influence will be enlarged. We constantly pray here at the church, and we plan here at the church. This coming up week, we'll do a two-day planner where all of our staff goes away, and we do nothing but plan for the future. What do we do? We pray, God, show us what to do. And then we put a plan in place. Now, overall, we have a plan. You see it. It's on the walls here, here and here, and it's all over the building. We have those three waves. That's our ultimate plan of what we're trying to get accomplished. What does that mean? Well, the top wave says 
we want to connect people to God. The middle wave says we want to connect people to one another. And the bottom wave says we want to connect our church to an outside lost world. So what we're trying to do is, our plan is this. We want to get people connected to God Almighty. And we want to get people connected to each other within the church. And then we want to take our church and go outside the walls of the church and reach people that need help. That's our plan. And what are we doing? We're praying all the time, God, give us ways to do this. Coming up in December, we have the Spirit of Christmas service. I mentioned a while ago, Bobby Bowden. He spoke at our Spirit of Christmas service. This year, we have Kaylee McElhaney. Do does anybody know who Kaylee McElhaney is? I can't already say her name. Kaylee McElhaney was a, is a little blonde. She's about this tall. She was Trump's uh, press secretary. Remember her? A little fireball. She didn't take nothing from nobody. She is a fired up believer for Jesus Christ. She has a testimony for God Almighty. She's been through some things in her life you cannot imagine what she's been through. And we got called up and said, hey, would you like to come and speak at our church? Told her the plan of action, what we're doing here. She said, I'd be honored to come. And she's going to come here on December the 12th, and she's going to preach. Oh, excuse me. No, women don't preach. She's going she's to give her story. She's going to tell her story on that Sunday morning. Hear me. There will be people that will come to church on that morning to hear her that would never come to church to hear me. They'll come to hear her. So we're using that as a way to reach people on the outside. Are you with me? That's what we do. That's our plan. And we pray for God to take this plan. You Next Sunday when you show up, we're beginning a series of messages called lift off we're going to launch we're going to have a launch series it's going to be called lift off you're going to get a booklet and in that booklet there are i don't know how many testimonies probably 35 40 50 testimonies of people from our church that have written out their testimony about things that they were going through in life and how they got through those things and they tell their story and we're going to take those stories and apply them to scripture and we're going to have a daily devotional for four consecutive weeks and I'm going to preach sermons on this idea of the uh, of liftoff it's it's going to be around the space theme the NASA theme by the way did you know that the guy that headed up Trump's NASA is a Bible, listen to this now, he was a Bible-believing preacher. He was the head of NASA. Yeah, one more time. He, I, I saw him preaching on the Liberty Convocation, Liberty University Convocation. I saw him on TV preaching. I called him up. I said, man, you got to come to our church. We're going to get him to come to our church. He is a he, he, he's, he, he was a congressman, and Trump hired him to be the head of NASA. <laughs> he believes that God created the universe. He believes that God is behind it all. He believes that all the order that we see in the universe is because God made the universe. And he's the head of NASA, was. Biden fired him. Not going to say any more about that. That's enough. Probably another time I'll say more about it, but right now I'm not going to. But he's a Bible believer. And you listen to him talk about space and how it all fits together. That's what we're going to do for four weeks. We're going to talk about things like that and bring you stories and illustrations from space. It's going to be an interesting, interesting sermon series and Bible study time. I hope that you'll be here. And invite somebody to be your friend so we can get them connected to God and maybe to other people, to Jesus as their Savior. 2017, I was flying back from Detroit. I had been speaking up there. I was flying back on an airplane and I was praying. I said, God, Give me 10 years. 
I want God, I want to, I want to, I want to, I want to see you expand my coast. God, expand my influence in the next 10 years. That was in 2017. God, give me a way to do that. Now, as I said last Sunday, I don't believe God gives extra revelation. This is not biblical. This is hard impression that he put on my mind and heart. I took out a pad and a pencil, a paper, a pad and, and a pen. I started writing. I wrote five pages. God gave me a plan. He said, I want you to start five campuses, five daycares. And perhaps, he didn't say this, but later on this came to me, five thrift stores. And I said, okay, and I wrote it down. I started writing down. I wrote down all the details. God said to me, if not now, then when? <laughs> if not you, then who? <laughs> I said, okay, God, I hear you. And I came back and I presented that to the church. And God began to work. And God has begun to expand our coast. What are we doing? Well, we're starting five campuses and five daycares. And here, here's where they are. If you were to look at those stars and where they are, they represent places where we're starting campuses. We've already started a campus in Beulah. We, we have about 200 people that meet there. We've only been going a couple of years. 200 out there. Starting September the either 12th or the 15th, we're starting a new campus in North Pace. We've bought 40 acres of property, y'all, on Chamukla Highway. It's unbelievable. We're going to take the back 20 acres of that. We're going to sell that, develop that into a little mini subdivision, and the back 20 acres is going to pay for the front 20 acres. We're going to have 20 acres on Chamukla Highway. They tell me that there's going to be 8,000 new homes built within a five-mile radius of that piece of property. Is God going to expand our coast? He is. He's going to do it in Beulah. He's going to do it in North Pace. And then next, after that, we're going to Navarra. My daughter gets on to me every time I say Navarra. She say, Dad, you said it wrong. You're supposed to be Navarra. I said, it's not Navarre. Anybody can say Navarre. It's Navarra. <laughs> so now when I say it, I say it to irritate my daughter. It's Navarra. <laughs> so then wherever it is, however you say it, that's where we're going. We're going to Navarra. And then we're going over to Perdido. And then we're going to Molino. And we're going to have campuses <laughs> in Beulah and in North Pace and Navarra and Perdido and Molino and daycares and all those places and hopefully thrift stores and all those places. And what are we doing? We're expanding our coast for God. Not for me, not for you, but for God. So we can reach more people for the gospel. Influence. These next seven years, I want to see the influence of this church multiplied over and over and over and over again. Jabez prayed that prayer. I prayed that prayer. God's doing it. <laughs> God's doing it. Now, look at the last point. Number four, God answered his prayer just like he's answering our prayer. God answered the prayer of Jabez. In verse number 10, it says, And God granted him that which he requested. Wow. Isn't it awesome when you pray a prayer and there's no way it could be answered except God did it? I hope you've experienced that. I have. And Jabez prayed a prayer that no way could have been answered because he was a nobody. Only way his prayer could be answered is if a big God answered his big prayer and gave him a big answer. God will do the same thing for you. God's doing it for us. You realize we prayed for 1,000 people to be saved this year? We're right now at about 800 people saved this year. We prayed that God would let us see 350 people baptized this year. 
So far, we're over 200 and something people baptized already this year. We prayed for God to let 500 people join our church this year. Right now, we're over 400 new people that have joined our church this year. It's amazing. You see, when you ask God to expand your influence, God will hear your prayer, and God will do it. He'll do it in your business. He'll do it in your marriage. He'll do it in your ministry. He'll do it on your baseball team. He'll do it in your classroom. He'll do it for you. God is looking to expand your influence. Pray the prayer of Jabez. Ask God to do something big through your life. Don't settle for small-time stuff. Believe for big stuff from God. I've never told this complete story. I've told part of this story. I told it to my staff this past week in a staff meeting. Let me tell you this story as I finish. Everybody listen. Don't fold up your tent. Some of you, when I say that, you start folding up your tent. You start putting all your stuff together, putting your makeup on and stuff. Get ready to go home. Gentlemen, put your lipstick away. Okay, all right. <laughs> All right, hang on. Here we go. 1993. Most of y'all were not even born in 1993. 1990. Some of you laugh and go, <laughs> I was born in 1903. <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> 1993. We were down on Massachusetts Avenue. That's where our church was. Little building. God had blessed that church. But it had kind of gone south and just had a lot of problems. God began to bless us. We started using God to, you know, not using, asking God to bless that church. He, he started expanding our coast. We filled it up. That building was packed and jammed every Sunday. We had no parking space. You couldn't park across the street from that church because across the street from that church was a crack house. That's not an exaggeration. That's the truth. We'd come out of church and they'd all have them up there on the car like this. Well, they got them another one. They'd be arresting them. That was where we were. We asked God to bless us and expand our coast. I was sitting in my office. Had a little bitty office, a little metal desk. <laughs> Linda Palish was my secretary. And we had, we had a couple staff members. We had nobody. It was just just small beginning. Great. Anyway, I'm in my, in my office on, on a Saturday morning. Nobody there but me. And there was a knock on the door. I went to the door. Guy introduced himself as a deacon from East Brent Baptist Church. I didn't know him. He said, Pastor, can I talk with you? I said, sure. He came in. He said, I want to make a proposal to you. We want to buy your church. Sounding good. Little did he know that we had a group of men, about five men. Clyde Sanders, who was chairman of our deacon at that time. Charity Sanders Joyner, who was singing on the praise team today, she was 12. Her daddy was the chairman of the deacon board. It, 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 that, that just blows me away. She's up here singing on the praise team, grown woman with teenagers now, and she, her daddy was my deacon. He and a couple other deacons had been praying that God would do something for us and let us expand our coast. He knocks on the door. We want to buy your building. I said, How, how's this going to work? He said, well, you know, right next to our church is New Faith Missionary Baptist Church. It's an African-American black church. He said, we need to buy their property because we need to expand. So we're going to buy them. They got about two acres. And we're going to buy them. And then they're going to come down here and they're going to buy you. I said, okay, you buy them. They buy me. What happens to me? <laughs> he, said, he said, that's your problem. <laughs> you got to figure it out. I said, okay. I said, um, how, how, how much how much are you going to buy this property for? He goes, well, you got to tell me how much you want for it. My car salesman self started kicking in. I started thinking back to the days I used to sell cars. I started negotiating myself. I was thinking, okay, I'm going to get him up there. I'm going to beat him up. I said, well, uh, $600,000, he goes, sold. Gosh, did I, for, I should ask for $800,000. <laughs> he said, sold, we'll do it. I said, you kidding me? And they said, no, we'll do it. He said, we're going to buy them for $600. They're going to come down there and buy you for $600. I said, so I'm going to have six. Yeah. 
Well, okay. We did the deal. We had to go somewhere. We came up here and found the one building that faces W Street. It was one building and six acres of property. That's right. None of this was here, y'all. It was a boat dealership that had gone bankrupt. And they were just sitting, they were sitting, they'd been sitting there for years. And we made them an offer of six hundred thousand dollars. And they took it. So we now bought this new building with six acres of property for six hundred thousand dollars. That's wonderful. That's great. But we didn't have any way of remodeling it, turn it into a church. It was a boat dealership. We had no money, y'all. <laughs> Our offerings back then were, you know, fifteen hundred, two thousand dollars a week. We had no money. My dad was, he's in heaven now, but he was a big part of helping me on all this stuff back in those days financially. He came to me and he said, look, we're going to work this out. There's a fellow in our church then. He was a police officer. He got shot. Some of y'all know the story. His name is Jerry Henderson, Jr. He got shot. He was shot 12 times with an Uzi by a crazy madman. It put him in the hospital and ultimately paralyzed him. He's from the waist down. He's in a wheelchair. Well, he got a settlement from that shooting. And so he was in our church. His mom, his daddy was, his mom and daddy were here. They're still here. Well, daddy is in heaven, but his daddy's in heaven, but his mom is still here all the time. And we went to him and said, would you put up your money, the settlement that you got, will you put your money up as collateral for us to borrow against because we have no way to borrow the money except you put up your money as collateral? He said, I'll do it. He put up a million dollars as collateral, all that he had. We said, we promise you we'll pay it back in three years. We promise. So the bank loaned us the money against his money. And we went over and we remodeled that old building, turned it into a sanctuary, seat 600 people. It had choir loft and Sunday school rooms and the whole thing. And that's where we started Marcus Point Baptist Church. And that was 1993. It all came from a Jabez prayer. By the way, we did pay him back in three years. And that's another Jabez story right there because there's no way we could. <laughs> and we paid him back in three years. It came because we believed that if we prayed a big old prayer, God would give us a big old answer and enlarge our coast. And look what he's done. He's done it. And friend, listen to me. He'll do it for you. You've got to believe that. He'll do it for you in your marriage. He'll do it for you in your business. He'll do it for you in your ministry. He'll do it for you in your life. He'll do it for you. If you'll ask him and be a person of integrity. Don't take shortcuts. Don't take shortcuts. Do right. And God will bless your life. I promise you. Now, remember the prayer we prayed? God, will you please give me influence in your name? You prayed that prayer. Now when you leave out of here, you understand what it means. Believe it. Receive it that God's going to do it.